Now, it's with great pleasure I'd like to introduce our keynote for this morning and also our lightning talk to Zah, Nat Talkington, who has, has been on the Pearl Foundation. He has worked for Arai for a large number of years, organised the OzCon conference for a few, you know, a few shy of those years, ten, ten of those years. Uh, if you have the camel book, then you might want to get it signed by him. Uh, and he is also now on the Internet NZ uh, Council. So, Nat Talkington. Thanks so much. There will be a small amount of tutuing here while we get the machine switched over. I have totally enjoyed this amazing LCA experience. Can we just have a quick round of applause for those fantastic organisers and their hard work? <laughs> Look at... Look at those smiles. Those, those smiles have been there since the first day, which is absolutely amazing. Well done. You're off. <laughs> They're both broken. Testing. We've had a really great time organising it, actually, so over the Lovely. last 18 months. I don't quite know what we're going to do next week. <laughs> Sleep, I would imagine. High on the priority list. Thank you. So I prepared a fantastic keynote for you all this morning, full of personal anecdotes from my history, like the time Eric Raymond and I went duck hunting and we ended up in this small South American country being chased by banditos. I was running from the bullets and he was stopping to get the phone number of the rebel dictator's wife. You know, it's... Uh, it was, it was good times, and, and, and I, uh, I even found that email from Linus from roughly 1990 where he said, I'm thinking of writing a kernel, Nat. Do you think I should? Or will 1991 be the year of the Minix desktop? Mm. I said, no, I think it'll be 92. And then I spoke with Rusty Russell on Wednesday, and he said, you know... There's really just one type of keynote that I don't like, and that's the old guy who's been in the industry forever, getting up on stage and giving us these maudlin, self-indulgent wallowings of history. Well, fuck. Thanks, Rusty. <laughs> but you're not going to get those stories after all, because... So because I'm introducing the lightning talks, I thought instead I would give you three lightning keynotes to warm you up. And just to spite Rusty, the first one is going to be looking backwards. When I was in high school, they gave us small diaries to keep us organized. And at the top of each page were small quotations, inspirational quotations. I only remember two of them. The first is, he knew not what to say, so he swore, which I've tried to live up to all of my life. Thank you, school. And the second was, experience is a hard teacher, but fools will have no other. So I'm going to give you three lessons that experience has taught this fool the hard way. So the, the first is that we like technology. We all like technology. We use it. We program it. We control it. We think, therefore, that it should be able to solve problems and that solutions to problems in the world will come from technology alone. Or even in, a, in its weakest form, that this... This technology is the most part of the, the solution. And unfortunately, it's not technology that's stopping us from solving the world's problems. It's the stupid meat sacks we share this planet with. So you can see this on those silly warning labels that you get on products. This is a stupid, there's a story behind every one. Now, the vet here didn't think that Parker the dog... I mean, you can't read that, unfortunately, but it says, uh, may cause drowsiness, alcohol may intensify this effect, use care when operating a car or dangerous machinery. <laughs> the vet didn't think that Parker the dog was going to be operating heavy machinery. No, the vet had to put that warning on there because some stupid meat sack in the past had said, oh boy, have I got a real bad headache, I need some medicine, I need some serious medicine. Oh, I know, dog pills. Now I will be able to practice my bootlegger turns in the supermarket car park after school. So the hard part for the vet, or the hard part for, for science here wasn't inventing a great painkiller for dogs. The hard part was preventing stupid meat sacks from being stupid. Second lesson. I hated marketing. 
when I started at O'Reilly, I thought we had a deal. I would organize the conference and somebody else would market it. And we had that nice division of labor. You know, I did not make them wear my black T-shirts with RSA and four lines of pearl written as a barcode on it, and they would not make me shop at Banana Republic. However, however, I soon saw the marketing copy these people were writing, and it was terrible. It made my conference look like the big dork out. It was awful. So I went to my boss who said, what do you expect? They're marketing people. They can't program. They don't know open source from hot source. So I learned the lesson. It might be someone else's job, but you have to help that someone else. Because if they fuck up their job, it doesn't matter how well you do yours. Once again, you have to steer the other meat sacks. Now, finally, this brings us to a lesson from my marriage. The first 12 years... The first 12 years of our marriage were spent basically with me getting shit from my wife about how I made the bed. I couldn't tell the difference between the way I made it and the way she made it. It looked exactly the same to me. And then one day, through tears, she sobbed at me, I just want it to look like a hotel bed. I want it to be fluffy and I want there to be pillows and I want it to be look like something I can just jump in and snuggle up to. And then I understood. Now my honey gets the beds that she wants and she's taken the lawyer off speed dial. It's a win-win. When you tell people step-by-step step what to do, you're treating English as an imperative programming language. You're using it like it's C or Perl. And the lesson for me here was that there is another way of doing it. Right? You can tell them where you want to go and leave it to the intelligent meat sack to figure out how to get there. It's declarative programming. Now, when my imperative model fails me, I have something else that I can try to get what I want. And no, I don't know how to do functional programming for my wife. Um, she is not a higher order bride. Uh, and, and besides, what language would I use? Um, rascal? Uh, Gerlang? No. The, um, those languages are all built for parallelism, and uh, we're not a multi-core relationship. Oh, uh, time to move on. Keynote number two, the history of open source in New Zealand. It, it is a little known fact that computing in open source have long and glorious histories in New Zealand. And I thought that you would appreciate the rest of your stay more if you had a bit of background. At approximately the same time as Christ, New Zealand was settled by the Maori people who brought with them from East Polynesia a sophisticated tool-making culture. Excavations show they traveled regularly between Tahiti and New Zealand. Their primitive aircraft were made of coconut palm leaves and ran on fermented kava, but reconstructions have proven that they are sturdy and strong. When they got to New Zealand, these Polynesian pioneers found a virgin island paradise. For millions of years, evolution had taken its course, and the flora and fauna of this new land had many new wonders for them. Largest among these were the giant flightless birds, the moa. In the moa, the Maori found not only a nutritious meal, nutritious meal but also a useful array of nested chest bones. Researchers at the University of Canterbury have reconstructed a portion of a moa's chest from bones found in a dig near Machueca. From these bones, Maori were able to fashion rudimentary gears and cogs. They used this as they mined greenstone or punamu. Archaeological work has shown that this intriguing mineral's photovoltaic effects quickly led to rough and ready circuits and then to consumer electronics. Indeed, every Maori soon carried a punamu. The purpose of these early devices is unclear. Were they calculators or were they more like today's mobile phones? And what of the mysterious widescreen punamu? Experts agree that more research is needed. Ah, but this is an open source conference. You might be familiar with the art of moko, or traditional tattoo. These were circuit diagrams. Maori scholars are reconstructing the circuits and algorithms encoded in them, and there are signs that, without European intervention, and that with the culture of visible open source accelerating things, Maori would have developed quicksort technology by the mid-1800s. Yes, European settlement. Within a few short years, everything changed. With so much money to be made, trading with the Pākehā, Māori quickly forgot their pioneering Punamu work. And meanwhile, on this isolated island, far away from the Royal Society, settlers soon went their own way. Now, I don't know how well you can see this, but there are spots on the back of the sheep. Pioneering engineers developed the famous punched sheep calculator used in the census of 1884. Each sheep 
represented a single bit, a one or a zero, depending on whether there was a mark on the back of the sheep. The, uh, this image of the mustering of the one bits comes to us from the moving centenary celebration in 1984. The, uh, the massive outnumbering of people by sheep in New Zealand, it, which persists to this day, is a consequence, uh, had its origins in the vast herds required to implement 32-bit unsigned integer arithmetic across the entire dominion. Oh, and I sense that I'm almost out of time. I won't be able to get to the early trans-Tasman standards work resolving the Tim Tam chit-chat interoperability issues of the mid-40s. <laughs> so it only remains for me to say that I knew I would hit the wrong frickin' button at some point in time. <laughs> it only remains for me to say that you should visit Te Papa and get the true story for yourself because it's way more interesting than the one that I've presented. Uh, and then when you're done, you can go to the Reserve Bank building on the terrace and see the Moniac, which is a water-based calculator. It's an economic simulator built by a pioneering New Zealand economist in the 50s. It's reconstructed. It simulates the flow of money through the economy with the flow of water. It turns out to be very helpful around budget time, I'm told. Um, and finally, the, the last keynote for the morning, I used to work for O'Reilly. I would figure out which conferences and books they should have for the topics that would be popular in nine to 18 months. So I'm going to tell you in th only three minutes how you too can easily predict the future. Now you can't do it the way O'Reilly did it because they had uh, heaps of people with math PhDs on staff and statistics and all that kind of stuff, and that's way too hard. But having had a look at the blogosphere's predictions for 2010, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have to be that difficult. So here we go. So one known fact, you can draw a straight line between two points and carry that straight line on to infinity. This is the basic technique of futurology. So let's say you come to LCA and you see a talk on electric cars. And then on your way home, you read something else about electric cars in the fish and chip paper. Well, shit, it's obvious there is huge development going on in the world of electric cars and everyone else has missed it. We're all going to be eating electric cars for dinner. Some of them might fly. Congratulations, futurologist. You just made your first prediction. Now. Up here, when I say qualify, I mean, I'm not talking about getting qualifications, like, you know, a PhD in statistics or anything. That would actually you know, interfere with this process. No, no. I'm talking about qualifying everything you say. So as in, uh, by 2012, electric vehicles may make up 12% of New Zealand new car sales. And you can be as precise as you like with this technique. By 2012, nipple clamps may cause 14.37% of visits to the North Shore accident and emergency between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9.33 p.m. on alternate Prime Fridays. So long as you've got the weasel word, you're set. Now, this technique for plausible deniability is well known by science journalists who may be fuckheads. Now, just, just a word here. Just a word here. It is a serious matter when an analyst as an investment in a company they promote. You have to know exactly what your investments are in because they're data points. You only need one more and you've got a straight line, baby. Don't worry about those tedious disclaimers. You know, modern audiences, they know. They're savvy to this kind of stuff. This is a post-ironic society. We can, we can get this. You know, we know that you aren't going to be biased by the possibility of financial gain in the predictions that you make, not at all. And of course, having shares in a company that you believe in, well, it's just common sense. I mean, if you think it's good, of course you should be in there. Would you take advice from someone who didn't? No. Now, we all know that the future is probably going to be like the present because the same stupid meat sacks are going to be in both. But nobody wants to hear that. So everybody wants to hear how new technology is going to make the future better. It's going to be shiny. It'll be rounded corners and heaps of chrome. So all that shit. So, so feel free to exaggerate. Supersize your future predictions. Everyone does it. Nobody minds. So there you get electric cars may be cheaper than their components in the future because there'll be an advertising model and we'll all be showing ads to each other and webcams on the bonnet will automatically tot up the eyeball hours and the resulting cash flow will be nine times the GDP of Canada. <laughs> now, now, did you see what I did just there? I added in business models and a subtle reference to Google. See, if you can take two trends... You can put them together, and now you've got a third trend. And you can keep doing this. I'm going to call 2015 as the year when Arduino-based, Wiimote-controlled, multi-core advertising-based social search on Rails may just hit the mainstream. <laughs> and remember, folks, if any of this comes true, you heard it here first. Thank you. Now, I'd like to get the, uh, the lightning talkers ready, if that's at all possible.
because we are going to switch to having a large number of people give a large number of talks in a very short period of time. Let's see if we can make that magic happen. That magic has happened. Now we're going to aim for um, not being terribly late into the break. I do apologize if we burst into it, but uh, there was just too many excellent stuff, too much excellent stuff. The first speaker here is Selena Deckelman to tell you about how to fix a rigged election. Yeah, that's right. Make it welcome. Do I get the clicker? <laughs> Matt. Yes. <laughs> I emphasized about nine times to all the speakers that you are to hand off the microphone and the clicker, and you are not to take them back to your seat with you. <laughs> Presenter fail. <laughs> all right. Has my timer started? So, hi. Good morning. I'm here today to talk about how a bunch of normal people use technology to repair a rigged election. So um, in the spring of last year, this person sent an email to the PostgreSQL hackers list and asked, hey, does, anyone wa does anybody want to go to Nigeria? And I said, yes, sure, I'll go. And I hopped on a plane a couple months later, and I ended up in Ondo State, which you can see right there, kind of in the south. Um, and what I was there for, actually, was to give some PostgreSQL training to some people who had just recently uh, yeah, joined the government there. Here are my students that I had, or a few of them. Um, and basically, I spent a week there helping them uh, learn about Postgres and also uh, architect um, a set of applications because they wanted to do a census and, um, and also uh, voter registration, actually. And so while I was there, I actually learned a little bit about Nigerian politics. I don't know about you, but I actually didn't know anything about Nigerian politics before I went there. So I tried to distill out what I learned into six steps to unrig an election. And I'm going to share that with you today. So first step, you have to actually run for political office. Uh, so here you'll see uh, Mimiko. Uh, who was part of the Labor Party, a fairly small party that actually wasn't in power in any of the state governments. There's quite a few states in Nigeria. And then uh, the, other, the other fellow there is Agugu, and he was the incumbent. So there was actually an election that occurred on April 14, 2007. And uh, by all accounts, both in the international and the local, the local observers that were there, the election didn't go so well. Uh, <laughs> People were pretty upset. They felt that um, their election had been stolen, and so there was some violence. Um, it went on for, for a few days um, into the next week, um, and in the end, as you might have guessed, uh, Mimico lost. Um, and so at that point, they really felt that they had actually won based on polling that had occurred before, before the election, um, so they had a choice. Uh, they could either accept what had just happened, or they could fight it. So they decided to fight it, um, and on May 14th, about a month later, they filed a formal protest and started collecting um, the ballots to try to analyze them. So um, at this point, they had all of these ballots, and they needed to classify them, look at them, figure out you know, if there had been fraud. So they needed a little technology. Um, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these ballots, but basically when you, when you vote in Nigeria, you uh, put your fingerprint next to the person that you vote for, and that's how, they're, that, that, anyway, that's how they tally everything. So um, what they did is they took all of these ballots, they ended up with about 120,000 of them, and, um, and they scanned them in. So they had some electronic copies. And here are a couple of the guys that worked on this Funk Show and uh, Cyril, and I spent quite a bit of time with them talking you know, about, about their plans for the future while I was there. Um, they also decided to bring in an outside expert, this guy Adrian Forty, he's a, a British uh, fingerprint expert. And um, he started looking through these ballots and found some amazing consistencies in the <laughs> fingerprints. <clears throat> and uh, so it took, it took a little while, you know, several months. But in the end, they found that 84,814 of them were duplicates. And um, among those, 360 were exactly the same. 
In one case, yeah. So um, over the next two years, so they had all this evidence, um, and they spent the next two years working through the court system uh, trying to get the result of the election reversed. And in the end, they won. So, um, yeah, so they unrigged it. Unfortunately, um, that was just the first step of many. Um, you can see here uh, there's a line that's been cut here. Um, the outgoing government went around vandalizing uh, things just to make it difficult for the people who are coming in. Um, that phrase right there is a Yoruba saying that means um, left like thieves. Uh, so anyway, their work continues on fixing that stuff today. Seat Deck is the IT organization that uh, formed after, uh, after the election, and they are doing really cool stuff like setting up microwave links between uh, cities, and I only have five seconds left. Anyway, they're doing it again in another state, in Onsen State, and you can actually uh, find out more about it if you just search. Search for elections. Thank you. Hi, so uh, I'm Jeremy, and uh, I'm going to tell you what the church Turing thesis is and uh, why it's really cool. Um, so you've probably all heard of Alan Turing. He's the guy that uh, cracked the Enigma code uh, in World War One and. World War II, one of those, <laughs> you know. Uh, so he invented this machine called the Turing machine. Uh, it's a machine that moves up and down an infinitely long uh, tape, reading and writing symbols as it goes. It's a, a really simple kind of abstract computa computation model. And the astonishing thing about it is that you can build a universal Turing machine. So that's a machine that can read the instructions for another machine off the tape and emulate it. So it's an extremely general concept of how computation works. And uh, Turing hypothesized that maybe the human mind is, in fact, uh, one can be emulated by one of these machines. It's so general that Turing and Church, independently at about the same time, uh, proposed that anything that could be computed could be computed by one of these, these machines. It could compute any function. So this kind of looks like a computer science problem. It's uh, talking about what we can compute and what we can't compute. A whole thing, whole thing problem like deciding whether or not a given program will stop is uh, an example of something that we provably can't compute. Um, but actually, this, uh, this theory has profound, implement uh, profound in, uh, implications for um, uh, our ideas about how the universe is actually structured. So I want you to think about space, like the space in between two things, not spaces in the Hubble telescope. I want to know if space is divided into little, tiny, indivisible chunks, or uh, if it's continuous. If I can uh, move continuously between two points, or if I have to jump at some level. So this circle is in space somewhere. Where is it? So we can define a reference point and some directions that we can go in from that reference point. Uh, typically, we call the reference point the origin, or zero. Uh, so that circle is x meters to the right of the origin and y meters above it. But how accurate do x and y need to be before we've completely described the position of the circle? If the answer is infinite, infinitely accurate, then we can't ever com accurately compute any physical process because you just can't do computations in it with infinitely long numbers. So if we examine the Church-Turing thesis, we actually can come to one of three conclusions. The first conclusion is that you believe Church and Turing's ideas, that nothing, anything that we can't compute just can't exist. This means that the universe must be made of information and must be describable by information, i.e. ones and zeros. Uh, and that leads us to believe that space is discrete, so divided up into these little chunks. The second option is the universe is not a Turing machine and there exist things we can't compute. <laughs> Infinite precision coordinates. And okay. if you want to look at more, these pages. Thank you. Um, hang. Oh, hang on, hang on, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got, hang on, we got the wrong order. Ne next one. Yeah. Lena's up next, isn't, aren't you? I believe so, aren't you? Have I, have I got that wrong? As you were, as you were. Day of fail, day of fail. Hit, hit next on the clicker and we'll see who's next. I believe it's Lena. Lana, sorry. That's me. Yes. That's me. 
Sorry. You next. Sorry. Ah, okay. Who here knows what Girl Geek dinners are? Woo! Who's been to one? Not so many. <laughs> Who was at the Girl Geek dinner on Wednesday? Yay! Who had been to a Girl Geek dinner before Wednesday? Three, four. Oh, okay, we've got a couple. Uh, my name's Lana Brindley. I run the, the Girl Geek dinners in Canberra. Uh, I've been doing it for about a year. This is my website, so you're more than welcome to check it out. Um, been, we're just about to have our fourth dinner. It's on the 26th of February, if you happen to be anywhere near Canberra. Um, Girl Geek dinners are basically, the idea is that... Um, sorry, I've lost my track. The idea is to, to be able to promote a space where women who work in IT can go and speak and have a, have a social conversation with other women who work in IT. Unfortunately, many, many women in engineering departments are the only woman in their department, or one of only one or two women in their department. It helps to break down the isolation by being, by being able to provide a space where anywhere up to, to 40 or 50 or 60 people, all women, can get together and talk about what they do best. The, uh, the main point I want to make, and I'm probably going to be really, really short here, is that the, <laughs> the Girl Geek dinners are run entirely by volunteers, people like me. We, uh, we also have jobs that we're supposed to turn up at occasionally. We also, in the most case, have families. Uh, we also have other things that we like to do with our time. And what that, what that can mean is that um, Girl Geek dinners can die. It's really sad. Oh. <laughs> Um, I've been speaking to, to uh, some of the other organisers and the one in Brisbane is in danger of dying. Oh, So everybody, where's Bri do you know where Brisbane is? Anyone going to Brisbane? Two. <laughs> one. Okay, um, basically what I'm trying to say is, I've got a minute left, and I just want to say support your local Girl Geek dinner, even if it's not in Brisbane. Uh, get along to a dinner. I, uh, email the organiser, say, hey, can I help? It might be something as simple as putting a sign up in your, uh, in your lunchroom at your workplace. The other thing is, if you don't have a Girl Geek dinner in your area, start one. There is plenty and plenty and plenty of help out there, including from the original founder of the Girl Geek dinners in London, uh, including myself, including um, uh, Brenda, who does the local Wellington ones. Please, please, please get along to your Girl Geek dinners. Have a, have a uh, show, show of support for the girls. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan McGarry, and I'm here on behalf of the Pacific Islands chapter of the Internet Society, as well as the Vanuatu IT User Society. And I want to promote a conference that's coming up September 13th to 17th in Port Vila, Vanuatu. Now, most of, most of you, when you think about the South Pacific, you'll think about things like this, probably like this, and maybe a little hint of this, and almost certainly something like this. But the fact of the matter is that this is probably more typical of the Pacific than anything else that you're going to see, with a technology that starts around here. So when we talk about development in the South Pacific, we need to be talking about really novel ideas, novel products, and they need especially things like OLPC, like this that you see here. And it all needs to work in places like this. Now, this is not jungle. This is my neighborhood in Port Vila. It's a city that's facing a 4.7% annual population growth rate. It means that infrastructure is never going to keep up. So infrastructure for people in Vanuatu has to look something like this. There's got to be a lot of MacGyverism in it, otherwise people just aren't going to be able to afford it. And that's why we need you to come here to Port Vila in Vanuatu, nice place, um, because when you're hacking FOSS, we want you to be talking or thinking about people like this. We want you to talk to guys like this. He's actually a really talented Lisp programmer, but none of you have ever heard of him. So we don't want you thinking outside the box. We really want, what we really want to do is put you inside a very different box. We want you to do it for his sake, for her sake, and especially for their sake. 
So, the conference runs September 13th to 17th, 2010. If you're interested in attending, we'd really uh, just keep an eye on the, on the PickISOC.org website. And if you're interested in presenting something or running an activity, either come and see me here or send an email to the, uh, to the address that's up there. Now, it's a little bit long, and I have, uh, I guess, a little less than a minute left. So I'll just leave this up here for a little bit and babble on about a few details of the, uh, of the conference. The um, best part about the conference is there's no fee. So all you need to do is get yourself the airfare to get there. It's three and a half hours from Sydney, less than three hours from Brisbane, um, three and a half hours from Auckland, and uh, a little bit of walking around money will put you up. There's lots of couch surfing, and you're, you'll be staying with some really great people. Vanuatu is a nice place, but there's a hell of a lot that you guys need to learn about us, and uh, I think that's really the core of the message. So thank you all very much for your time. Now, is Pia here? Do we have Pia War in the room? No, I think I believe she's sick, so we'll move right along to the next speaker. So yeah, my name is not Pia Wall. Um, so I'm Dan Peterson. Um, Google Wave is a new um, communication collaboration tool designed around a, uh, a distributed set of network providers, all independently operating, and there is no central server. Um, but beyond being a product, um, there's actually a big protocol effort that we're working on. Um, so uh, the idea is to use open APIs and standard protocols to work together to improve communication and collaboration across the web, so not in just one given product. I want to tell you three things you probably don't know about the Wave Federation effort. Um, first of all, we open source the operational transform algorithm and what we call Fed1. So OT is the heart and soul of the communication and collaboration um, that happens inside a wave um, and manages concurrency control. Fed1 is a basic implementation entirely independent from Google's own implementation that can be used to sort of interoperate across um, other, other providers. Um, all in all, it's around 40,000 lines of code with more on the way, and it's all Java Apache 2.0. Um, we also, um, as shown here, have uh, a port open on Wave Sandbox so you can federate and prototype with uh, Fed1 or other implementations that might be out there, like Novell Pulse um, or other community projects. So Novell Pulse has already actually taken the code we open sourced and is um, federating with the Wave Sandbox. There's also other community projects, and we're working together um, to sort of flesh out the various use cases for the Wave model. Um, we need to get it beyond just one product and to, to, to really improve communication and collaboration across the web. Um, but the, the, the idea here is that there's a variety of different ways to get involved. Um, so in this scenario, like, it, what, what I would like to do here is, is encourage you all to get involved and give your ideas to this effort. Um, in this scenario, there, there's two wave providers and three users, as shown. Um, when a wave like gets created, it's actually singly homed on a given wave provider. But the, the question then becomes, um, Say we have a wavelet hosted on provider A. Um, if provider A just dies, um, what should happen to that wavelet? Uh, should, should the users that are on B that, that were communicating before um, be able to continue collaboration? Does, but then B would have to take advantage, take, take over that wavelet. Um, and should the conversation become read-only? Um, they could fork it, I suppose, but there's a, a big issue around uh, sort of concurrency of the operations. What, What's actually more of a destructive case is that um, the, the network to A could actually die. And that actually appears to be indistinguishable from the A falling over scenario, but it's actually worse because A is still operating and A users can continue updating the wave. Um, and so the, there are, are uh, like lots of different issues to work on as we, we roll out the Wave Federation effort. And uh, I'd just like your help to, to help make the, uh, the open source wave prevail, if you will. Um, so thanks for listening, and uh, shout out to James Purser for uh, helping with the graphics. Okay, um, two disclaimers. Um, one is like, I'm completely bored of this topic, and um, I've, over the week I've changed. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that works. <laughs> and the other one is, I was drunk when I did my slides. Um, so Floss Manuals writes documentation like this, and like this, and like this. Um, the topics are different, and the languages change, but the um, tone is constant. It's always kind of friendly and simple, and it's got lots of pictures, and it tells you how to do stuff. It's goal-oriented. Not, um, it's not like this, which um, is for reference, not, not for learning. And it's written with, uh, um, by little groups of people getting together in a room, writing together most of the time. But um, yeah, I'm bored of that. <laughs> um, yeah, this is how I got into it. Um, I'm an artist, and it's a complicated story, but I um, was doing an artwork in Dunedin on a little island which, and with this man here, Adam Hyde, who um, we needed to find a species of seaweed in one day, a new species. That's not new. So we were there together. Um, people came down and they drew pictures of seaweed. Was drawing a picture as part of the process. Um, and I got a text message from a friend in Wellington who was saying, um, how do I, what's an OG file and how do I make one? And he had a Mac. And I was telling Adam, you know, there's no way I can possibly answer this text, text message. <laughs> I won't do it on that. Um, and he said, I'll look it up in the book. And he had a book from Floss Manuals. He's, he runs Floss Manuals. And there were these pages that just kind of explained how to make an OG file with VLC, which you can get on the Mac. So I was able to do tech support via SMS. Anyway, and so the books are printed on demand. But I'm bored of Floss Manuals. So I'll talk about um, another, another geek um, publishing project. There's a little busker up on um, Cuba Street. He, he makes books like this. He, he, he actually <coughs> he wrote the first ever um, the first ever book about the internet in New Zealand. One of those ones because it came out in 1994. <laughs> and <coughs> you, you can buy these books. So. Just go up to Cuban Mall. He's selling them. It's, it's his living. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. That's me. I'm here to talk about the uh, New Zealand Linux Users Group. I figured since we're in New Zealand and we're here at a Linux conference, someone should at some stage mention that we have Linux Users Groups in New Zealand. So um, that's a bit about me. You've got about three seconds to read that because I've got far too many slides. Um, I am a network engineer by trade. I'm a sysadmin as a hobby. I'm also involved in the New Zealand Open Source Society, the NZLUG and the Auckland Linux Users Group as well. I do not have anything to do with my employer standing up here, for the record. Um, the NZ Lug was established about 1998 uh, by a bunch of mainly Auckland-based uh, Linux fans, and it was basically a mailing list and an opportunity to get together on a periodic basis and talk Linux. Uh, they had a website set up, a domain, linux.net.nz. My first involvement with the Lug was about a year later, around 1999. It's quite scary, actually, looking at the post I made 10 years ago. <laughs> um, there are now several Linux users groups running around New Zealand. Um, because NZLUG was based in Auckland, it kind of became the Auckland Linux users group by default. There were some folks who didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that NZLUG was purporting to represent all of New Zealand in the Linux community. So uh, we fixed that and we forked. Uh, so the Auckland Linux users group was established in 2005. Um, the idea was that we ported all the Auckland specific stuff off to the Auckland LUG and the NZLUG remains as a national forum. There are a lot of other Linux users groups in New Zealand that we've got good relationships with. That's them that I know about. So uh, there's a few around the place, especially in the North Island. There's um, some relatively small geographic areas with active Linux users groups, which is really great. From an NZ-like perspective, um, as one of the administrators, I can tell you, 
Um, we want everybody who's interested in Linux in New Zealand and also outside to feel welcome. We provide facilities in the way of a website and a mailing list and a, a mailing list facilities if you wanted to host your own. Um, you just have to ask us. The regional lugs also have mailing lists. Uh, obviously, their focus is in the regional area, and they're the guys who host the meetings. Uh, there are some very strong Linux users groups in New Zealand. Um, I can't say this. I mean, I'm talking to the converted here. I know you're all Floss fans and, uh, and all that, but I guarantee there's at least a good portion of you out there who might not be so loud on your local lug, and I, all I can tell you is that we need our experienced people involved in the lugs. Um, some stuff that uh, NZ Lug offers... Very quickly, some photos from, recent, from events. This is an install fest in 2002 held at uh, University of Auckland by NZLUG and their local software developers club with a K. Um, I had to go to the Wayback Machine. Anyone recognise this head? <laughs> That's Liz at a, at a Computer World Expo. She decided to wave the penguin flag on her head. And you're done. Thank you. I've got more. Come and see me if you're interested. Now, next I have Kate Oliver, but I do not know if she is here. Would you like to present in her stead? If, do you need any props? A small piece of paper is sufficient? Fantastic. I appreciate your standing in at short notice in such a unique and interesting and bizarre way. <laughs> There are no slides. I, I don't think that really, you know, that, that probably won't be a problem. It's just going to be hard doing origami while holding a microphone. Yeah. Okay, Lynn, do it. Come, Lynn, come. We have a stunt microphone stand coming to your assistance. <laughs> and such a cute one, too. Thank you, Lynn. I'm going to be teaching you guys on behalf of my sister who stayed up too late. Um, on how to make an origami penguin. Most of you probably have been past the volunteers' disc recently and seen our lovely display of penguins. Um, yeah, they, they go into wee tiny from wee big. So I have made a square, a very messy square, but it's a really a square, honest. Um, and first you start off by getting your square and folding the insides to make little wings. I'll fold it and then show. So you fold the sides in halfway, so you make little bits like that. You then fold it so the wings are on the outside, like this. Then fold it back in, put the tip down, and then pull it slightly, and then squish it. Squish it good. Keep it PG, please. <laughs> it's their dirty, dirty minds, not mine. That is your penguin's beak. There you've got its wings. And then if you fold this up, And squish it again. I love that squishing. They have a little penguin with a tiny little tail. And that is your origami penguin. If you need any more instructions, don't, you know, come to the radio desk and I'll show you. Yeah, if you come to your radio desk with a square piece of paper, I think most of the people who are there can do it. So they can help you. We can do it. Hello, my name is Carl Worth. I wasn't clever enough to put my own name on the slide. Um, I, I'm, I have a common problem, which is that I often get to the end of the day and I look back and I realize that I've spent the majority of the time of that day that I was awake dealing with, reading, processing, or primarily deleting email. It's an unpleasant thing. I find that I, I do that very often, and yet at the same time, I never find myself waking up at the first thing in the morning saying, you know what I want to do today? 
I want to spend every waking moment dealing with the email. I get way too much email, and I want to get rid of it as fast as I can. So this is what uh, I'm going to tell you about what I've been doing, um, how, the things I've been exploring to try to get rid of mail for the last few months. Um, I've been working on a project that I call Not Much, and I'm going to warn you that this is truth in advertising because not much is not much of an email client. If you have an existing email program that does a lot of great things, um, probably all of the great things it does, not much doesn't do, but that's okay. Because the, the very few things that your email program doesn't do, that's just what not much is going to add to it. But, so it's not very much. It doesn't, um, I don't know, there's these mail protocols like POP or, I don't know, IMAP or SMTP. Not much doesn't do any of that. Not much doesn't receive mail. Not much doesn't send mail. Um, <laughs> <coughs> Jamie Zawinski thinks that every email, pro every program evolves until it gets to a point where it can actually send email. I, I'm, in I'm intent on making this the one project that is never capable of sending email. Um, the story of Not Much actually begins with a project called SUP. SUP uh, is an email program written by uh, William Morgan. His attempt was to recreate the experience of a Gmail. So he wanted an entirely search-based email program, but not web-based. This actually runs off of a local mail store on, on, on your local machine. Um, you've got tagging. You've got all these kinds of things that are similar to the Gmail experience. What SUP also has is it's an, um, it's an entirely monolithic email program, like not much isn't, uh, written in Ruby. So search-based email, good. Uh, the, the curses client in Ruby was really bad. Ruby was slow. The curses uh, UI had a lot of interfaces. So not much was my answer to SUP. Um, there's no, uh, another few reasons why we have the name not much. Keith, uh, here's an, uh, a quick demo of the not much uh, um, command line interface. This is what Keith Packard saw when he first ran not much new. He started counting his mail, and it found 1.2 million messages. Not much says, that's not much mail. It can search that really fast. It's not going to be slow. And another aspect of not much is that when you look at your inbox, you want to find nothing. There's nothing in the inbox. It, not much gives you new tools to process your mail down to nothing. So it's search-based. It's really fast search. The fast search becomes, comes by way of Zapian, a really cool stealth library that most of you haven't heard about that does great uh, searching capabilities. We actually do have a functional interface uh, on top of not much built uh, inside Emacs. That one actually can send mail. Um, we also have a command line interface. Oh, a library. It's great stuff. Well done. Kia ora koutou. My name's Mark Osborne. I'm Deputy Principal of Albany Senior High School in Auckland on the North Shore. Um, it's a brand new senior high school. Uh, we have... I'd, I'd gone backwards. And that's taking time. So that's my one and only slide. That's the good news. Um, so just a quick good news story with a moral at uh, the end of it. Brand new senior high schools. We have 450 students. We, have, uh, we will have 1,400 students in about five years' time. It's going to be quite a big school. This year we have uh, 200 desktops. We have uh, 50 staff laptops, and they all run Ubuntu Linux. We're an open source school, and how we got to, um, to be there was we have a vision. What we want to do is nurture, inspire, and empower our students to achieve well and to become good citizens. We had a meeting. We sat down to, dis to start to design the information systems that the school would have, and we looked at our vision, and we thought, how can we be free, open, transparent, help information to move through our community by using proprietary software? We can't. So we looked at each other, and we thought, I guess that means we're an open source school. So we then went to open system specialists in Auckland. We said, we want it to be like this, make it so, and they did. They did it in less than two months. And if you want to hear more about that, then there's a really good presentation this afternoon about the ins and outs. We, are, we have, as I said, um, 200 desktops running Ubuntu Linux. We've got all, the, all the, um, the kind of programs you would imagine on the applications like OpenOffice. We have the GIMP. We have uh, Scribus. We have students producing the school newspaper in Scribus. We have students teaching themselves 3D animation using Blender. Um, we have them touching up photos. Uh, we have them creating diagrams using Dia. We have um, a whole lot of open source uh, environments like Moodle, our learning management system, hosted by Catalyst here in Wellington. We use Mahara, thanks Penny, for um, our ePortfolio systems. We have Koha, thanks Chris and others, for 
um, our library management system. Uh, we have uh, the, the two great things that have come out of this uh, experience is, is um, apart from the fact that we learned that it is possible, was that um, we have a real culture of participation. We have a group of students who help support and develop our network. They, um, they do that largely because I think they can get under the hood and see what, uh, what makes things happen and see what contribution they can make. We have two students here. We're Shane and Andrew. Wave your hands. Here they are. These are the guys that you should be offering your internships to now, the, the banshees on the command line. Um, and the second thing that has been fantastic about it is that the Ministry of Education pays, um, on average, $10 million a year directly to Redmond to produce, uh, to put Microsoft software into every New Zealand school. We uh, said, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to become an open source school. And the moral of the story is... Even though it was gratis, we chose to be libre. Thank you very much. I believe you'll be needing this, sir. No, I made an exception for Paul. This is why I put him last. He's got his own weaponized PowerPoint to go through here. Everybody hear me okay? Fantastic. Hi, my name is Paul Fenwick. I'm from Pilk Training Australia. There has been somewhat of a reputation that I've picked up that I'm a bit of an evil scientist. And that's not true. I'm not evil. In fact, my goal is simply to make people's lives more interesting. They're easily confused. Now, I've taken an interest recently in social networking. And uh, all of you have probably encountered social networking. What it lets you do is create a network of people, and then you can tell them how social you are being. <laughs> what social networking is also really good for is finding friends that you might have lost touch with. So those childhood friends of yours, you can now meet again. And, of course, you're doing this, and what makes you feel really good is that while you're doing this, you're selling your most intimate details to advertisers. So, I found that this has a bit of a problem. And my problem with social networking is this. We're not gossiping, we're networking. I want gossip. I want juicy, juicy gossip, and I find the very best gossip is not when people become friends, but when they become enemies. <laughs> so I want to introduce this idea of unsocial networking. It revolves around the idea of unfriend events. When people stop being friends, that's interesting. Now, to do this, we need to find them. They're not normally shown in Facebook, but they're pretty easy to find. So some of you might know that I use a language called Perl. Perl has a particular module called www Facebook API that you can download from the CPAN, and it lets you run FQL queries, which is a Facebook query language. So if you want to get a list of your friends, you simply write a bit of FQL, which looks like that. And uh, then you simply run that on a regular basis, and you see if they've changed. And if they have, then you display a little notice to your status screen saying that you're no longer friends with somebody. But for this to be really juicy, you don't want to just do it on yourself. You want to run it on friends of friends. So people you don't even know who are breaking up with your friends, you can comment on that. <laughs> the problem... <laughs> the problem is if you try to do it through the API, you get these annoying error messages. Because apparently it breaks the terms of service and like it's a privacy violation, all this other bullshit. So <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, who cares? Because... Facebook has all of these wonderful undocumented features. And what you can do is you can punch straight through that Ajax layer. <laughs> and you can get the list of friends of any person on Facebook. The way in which you do this is you simply use that URL there. Um, the little box in the corner where you type in like a friend's name to search for them, that's what it goes and retrieves. And the best thing about it is it's way faster than the API. <laughs> And it's much, much more convenient because it requires no authentication whatsoever. <laughs> so I've been putting together a new Facebook application. And I think its logo stands for itself. <laughs> so 
So what does it do? Well, first of all, it automatically posts to your stream when it sees somebody unfriending you. The important thing, it does this without telling you. <laughs> so normally, the way that you're going to find that you've been unfriended is somebody else is going to tell you of that event. It also helps promote unsocial discussions. And it does this by whenever there's an unfriending event, it sets up a, scare, a shared discussion board, which is available to everybody except for the people who are actually unfriended. <laughs> so this is pretty much a social train wreck just waiting to happen. Now, it's not quite finished because I stayed up all of last night working on my slides, but I'm glad to tell you that it's now simply a, a simple matter of code. So when it is finished, it will be going up, um, posted on that URL, which is my Facebook page, and uh, you too will be able to make other people's lives interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and I have a bonus section as well. I just want to say a huge thank you to the volunteers. Um, in fact, it was a requirement of me doing this talk that I thanked this volunteer in particular for giving me coffee and reminded you about Open Day tomorrow. So thank you very much again. Well done. Thank you, Paul. I think we should put our hands together one more time to thank all of the fabulous lightning talkers this morning. Thank you. We are only 10 minutes into the half-hour break, so for the next 20 minutes, uh, you should go eat, drink, and be merry. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you.